Good morning. Good morning as people come in. Good morning, welcome. Hey, Timothy, how are you? Hey, Isabel. Luciano. I love saying it, Luciano. Good, good morning, welcome. Hey, Mr. Anche. Hey, Bridget. Hey, Dana Cooper, hey. I feel like I'm in Romper Room, and those of you who are old enough to remember Romper Room, and the one to say hello to everybody as they can, they come in. Well, I am saying hello and welcome. Welcome, I'm glad that you're here. So we're gonna get started soon as more folks trickle in. Good morning, good morning. Have a little mule, mellow music in the background to kind of set the mood. So we have a really great presentation for you all. And let me turn that music off in the background. So um, once again, welcome and good morning. And I would like to officially welcome you all to our second session of the SSP Community of Practice Virtual Series. So I'm your host, um, Duran Rutledge with the California PTC, and I will be the facilitator for today's session. So if you attended our first COP, you know that we had a great presenter, Bronze Courtney, who is the executive director of the HIV Education and Prevention Project of Alameda County, also known as HEPPAC. So that first session was about utilizing harm reduction services to address racial inequities. And if you missed it, you don't have to worry because like this session, we are recording it and it's gonna be available through our YouTube channel. So the purpose of our SSP Community of Practice series is to provide technical tea opportunities for our Western, Western, Geographic, Western Geographic Region partners in strengthening their SSP activities. So with that purpose in mind, we have another informative and engaging presentation in store for you all today. So our presenters today are from the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, also known as LEAD, and also by the other name of Let Everyone Advance with Dignity. And they will be highlighting their program, which is a structural intervention that provides diversion alternatives for individuals at risk of incarceration due to substance use. But before they get started, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about the CAPTC. So the mission of the California Prevention Training Center is to provide training in TA to help strengthen the capacity of healthcare providers to deliver quality, respectful, and inclusive services. The CAPT has delivered training and TA services to health professionals throughout the United States for nearly three decades. So under our current CDC cooperative agreement, our TA activities are provided in collaboration with our amazing partners from the Denver Prevention Training Center and the San Francisco Department of Public Health. So together, we work to support the needs of health departments and community-based organizations, like I say, in the Western region of the United States. So all of our services throughout or through our CB, CBA program are free to those who are directly or indirectly funded under the CDC's PS 19-1904 cooperative agreement. And some of the key activities that we provide as far as TA, syringe service programs, partner services, data to care, social determinants of health, and status neutrality. So we encourage you to reach out to discuss your TA needs, those specific to SSP activities or other TA needs that you might have. So that's a little bit about the CAPTC, our services and what we have planned for you all today. And I would like to take just a little time to find out who's in the room with us. So if you all would be so kind in chat to put your name, your organization and your role in the organization. 
So just type that in chat. And I am going to ask my amazing colleague, Mr. Shavar Johnson, as folks just um, put their information in chat, you know, just to kind of share some of the, the names and places that folks are from, if I miss any. So who do we have? So at the Karamoa, we have um, Iridian. Um, Iridian is joining us. Um, she, I'm a case manager, OC case manager. We have okay. Sydney um, from CDS, project coordinator in San Bernardino County, Department of Public Health. Um, we have Christine in the chat saying good morning. Uh, Christine Chayo, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your, your last name correctly. Public Health Nurse, LA County Department of Public Health, Division of HIV and STD Programs. Stephanie Diaz, MHCRN. Um, Jose Rangel Uribe, um, he, him pronouns, Los Angeles County Commission on HIV, Health Program Analyst. We have Tim Byers, uh, Syringe Exchange Program, Harm Reduction Specialist, Outreach Services at Kamukahai Health and Wellness on Big Island here in Hawaii. So sorry if I'm butchering any of these names. <laughs> See, now you know why I asked your bar versus trying to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Danielle, LA County Public Health, um, PHI, Lauren and Dahl, um, Shanti, Orange County, California. Uh, Maria says good morning in the chat. Good morning, good morning Maria. Um, Bridget um, Rogala, Program Specialist for Medical um, Ed, um, Hazelden, Betty Ford Foundation, Aria Moreno, APLA, Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse, Harm Reduction Specialist. And then we have a good morning from Isabel Fernandez, Case Manager at Alpha Project um, Harm Reduction Center in San Diego, California, and Connie Stevens from Shasta County Public Health, Registered Nurse um, is, is weighing in on chat as well. Okay. So we have a, a good group from a number of wonderful organizations. So, you know, keep putting your information in and hoping that everyone gets a chance to chat in, you know, where they're from, organization and their role. But I wanna, I wanna move us forward a little bit. And I wanna tell you about the learning objectives. So, so here are the learning objectives. So by the end of the three sessions, those of you who attend each of the SSP community practice will be able to identify three strategies for strengthening community engagement and SSP activities, which support people who inject drugs, discuss three strategies for integrating diversion programs and syringe services programs, and lastly, three, describe three harm reduction strategies to ensure equitable access to SSP and other HIV prevention and care services for people who inject drugs. So we have some um, good, wonderful, lofty objectives. And for those of you who attend all of the sessions, that's what we're hoping that you will be able to do by the end of our session. But I've got a serious question and I want you all to put the answer in chat or you know come off mute and just let me know. Okay, so this is this is serious. I just want to take you up, take you up, take a moment and I want you to think about this. So here it goes. So what's that one thing, that one drink from Starbucks that you swear you will never order again? I mean, I know we got the things that we love, but what is that one? thing. My thing is a caramel, caramel macchiata. So I had a caramel macchiata that was just nasty. So um, somebody said coffee, they're allergic to it. Oh my God, a pumpkin spice latte. Yeah, that, yeah, I wouldn't, mm -mm. that doesn't sound good either. So what do you think? What is, what's that, what's that one little nasty, just yucky, oh. Um, <laughs> Somebody says, thank you for reminding me the um, unicorn uh, um, frappuccino. I guess that wasn't a good one. Oh, somebody loves it. Unicorn, pumpkin spice. Okay, me too. Regular coffee is too strong. 
hot chocolate. Christine, really? Hot chocolate from Starbucks? That was nasty. That, you will never order that again. I'm hoping that maybe it was just because it, it wasn't good. But I love, you know, hot chocolate. Well, so, so, <laughs> so we know that there are a lot of things that folks are sharing that they would not order. Vanilla bean with pumpkin spice. Yeah, no. So this is what I have. So I have something for you all. So for a chance to win a $10 Starbucks e-gift card for something that we like, okay? For something that we like, I'm gonna ask you a riddle, okay? I'm gonna ask you a riddle and the first person who is able to answer the riddle correctly, by writing it into chat is going to win. So this is not for the nasty thing that we all kind of envision because I, you know, I just wanted to get you to the spot. So the good spot now is that put into chat the answer to this riddle. The first person who's able to do that will win. Okay, you ready? So here we go. So riddle me this. What belongs to you, but is used by others? What belongs to you, but is used by others? Some time, a lot of people are saying time. No, 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 that's not it. Try again. What belongs to you, but used by others? Up, oh, Ariel, Ariel, Ariel. It is your name. So Ariel, you were the first person to get in, I see you, Dana uh, Cooper, and you are not even eligible to, to try to even answer the question since you were the executive director of the California PTC, so you were automatically canceled out. But Ariel was the first to, to get it. And actually, I see that there's two people, so we're going to go for the first two folks. But thank you all for that little fun thing that we just did, and congratulations to the, the winners. And I will take your names down and make sure that we email that gift certificate to you via the, via the email that you use to sign up. Sound good? But a lot of people seem to get it after a, a while. So yes, it was <laughs> your name. And there'll be another opportunity a little later. So now I just want to kind of, kind of set the ground work for what we're going to do today. So this time I have a poll question for you all. And that poll call question is going to lead into today's discussion. So Glenn, if you will launch that poll. And the question is, diversion programs play a vital role in my jurisdiction in keeping people who inject drugs out of jail due to crimes associated with their substance use. Okay, so some strongly agree, some agree, some folks feeling a little neutral, some folks strongly disagree. So, and see the poll is still going. So what do you think? So, so diversion programs play a vital role in my jurisdiction in keeping people who inject drugs out of jail due to crimes associated with their substance use. So let's see what our poll says. Oh, folks are still chiming in. Okay, <laughs> and just when I was gonna hit close, folks are still. Okay. Yeah, they're, still, they're still coming in, we're at 65%. I, I see, <laughs> which is good because folks may be taking a moment to, to think about it. So that's not a bad thing. So what do you all think? What do you think? Yep, we just did it. Okay. So let me end that poll and share the results. So there, um, so we have a, there's a kind of a split. So some folks say neutral. And then there's some folks that say strongly disagree. And that might be neutral and strongly disagree because there may not necessarily be a diversion program in your jurisdiction or in your area, or you may be unfamiliar with how to access it. And those who strongly agree or agree, you know, may have had some kind of previous, may have had previous experience in working with a diversion 
program. So thank you all for that. So this leads into our discussion today. So our three presenters today will share some of the reasons how they identified the need for a diversion program and how they engage with law enforcement, the court systems, the community to provide a workable, to provide workable alternatives for people convicted of crimes due to their low level, um, low level, for people convicted of crimes due to their low level um, crimes <laughs> um, in support of their addiction. So these are individuals that because of their, their crimes were in jeopardy of jail and their program is an alternative to jail time for those individuals. So they are gonna do a more eloquent, eloquent way of explaining it than I just did, but I am so excited that they're here today. And without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and my screen and provide them the opportunity to not only introduce themselves, but provide an overview, overview of their project. So we have Sam Wolf, Sean Blackwell, and Tierra Dearborn. So welcome them. And thank you all for being here. Um, I'll pull up the slides and maybe we can do some intros. We also have um, another person with us here named Maria, um, who is somebody that has um, utilized the LEAD program. So she'll be able to share some of her experiences as well. But um, can everyone see the slide show? I can never, am I sharing the wrong screen? Yes, I saw it. Oh, it was the right one? Yeah. Sorry, one second, I'm, I lost it. You're good. Everyone can just stare at me as I figure it out. All right, can people see the slideshow? Yes. Okay. All right, so there's our title slide. Um, so I'm Sam Wolf. I'm a senior project manager for the LEAD program in Seattle, King County. Um, I'll pass it to Tierra. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's really good to be here and be in this space. My name is Tierra Dearborn. I work for the Public Defender Association in Seattle, King County uh, with Sam and Sean, and um, I am the uh, lead program director for LEAD in Seattle and King County. Hi everyone, my name is Sean Blackwell. I work alongside Tierra and Sam for the LEAD program in Seattle. Um, I work as one of the project managers. Um, the particular area of the city I work in is East Precinct and Southwest Precinct. That's the way that we split up the jurisdictions in which we work is according to the police precincts in Seattle. Nice to be here. And Maria, do you wanna give a quick intro for yourself? I don't think her mute, her audio is working. Oh. Uh oh, good to figure this out now. Uh, Maria, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, awesome. Glad you're here. We were just doing a quick round of intros if you wanted to introduce yourself to the group. Hi, my name is Maria Nevertakis, and I was, oh, I am a client of the LEAD program. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Maria. Um, all right. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Maria. Okay, all um, right. I'm a all right, so I'll um, get us started real quick. Um, Sam, Sean, and I work for, like I said, the Public Defender Association in Seattle. Um, we do not do public defense. Our office is a nonprofit organization that used to house public defense before the county took it over. Um, now we work on a number of um, different initiatives. Um, and one and the biggest and most well-known one is LEAD that stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion and Let Everyone Advance with Dignity. Um, 
So LEAD's approach centered at the intersection of public health, public safety, and racial justice. LEAD builds a non-punitive community-based system of response to better address problematic or unlawful behavior that stems from unmanaged substance use, mental health challenges, or extreme poverty. Outreach and case management workers coordinate with police and community leaders to reduce problematic behavior, sometimes over months and years. Um, LEAD started in Seattle in 2011 as a response to racial inequities in drug enforcement. And um, LEAD's focus is working with individuals who um, experience unmet uh, behavioral health needs, substance use disorder, and extreme poverty. And Sam, do you want to advance? Thank you. Um, LEAD is a pathway to long-term community-based care for people who commit or, at, or, or are at high risk of committing law violations related to mental health challenges or income instability. Um, so a lot of the folks that LEAD works with do, um, while it's not a requirement, most folks are experiencing homelessness when referred into LEAD services. And typically long-term um, chronic um, homelessness uh, behavioral health needs, and um, usually intergenerational poverty, um, intergenerational incarceration. Um, LEAD provides long-term case management and ongoing coordination with law enforcement and prosecutors to support stabilization and recovery and to reduce and prevent crime. The overall goal is to address people's underlying needs that drives the behavior so that people don't need to engage in the illicit economy to meet their basic needs. So um, LEAD is a strategy for address addressing public safety that leans on human services, client-centered approach, and harm reduction. And um, we do a lot of work to, um, to, to be accountable to the community um, and to center clients' experiences and address people's um, unmet needs using human services and client-centered services, and um, teaching the surrounding community and system partners that this is a better, more effective approach and more uh, human-centered approach. Do you want to advance, Sam? Thank you, and I'll pass it to Sam Wall. Oh, Sean, actually. Oh, sorry, Sean. Black. Yes, yeah. thank you. Tierra. Um, yeah, so as Tierra was just mentioning, um, we work with folks that experience behavioral health issues, that serious mental illness and or substance use disorders. And um, there's folks that are experiencing extreme poverty, folks that are engaging in um, the uh, illicit, illicit sex trade. Those are the population of folks that we work with. How do those folks actually come into the program? As Tierra said, this is a public safety program. So on, this, on the screen here, you can see that there's three referral pathways, means by which people can come into the program. The first one and the most longest standing one is the arrest aversion pathway. Um, in 2011, when the program started, it, uh, it started as an arrest aversion program. So police at the point of contact, when they make a determination, when they have probable cause to make an arrest, at that time, they can make a determination. You know what? I believe this person would be better served by engaging with intensive case management services as opposed to just going into the jail and perhaps bailing out and then ending up back in the community doing the same thing or somehow just going through the cycle of arrest, incarceration, release without addressing their underlying problems. They are back in the community doing the exact same thing again and cycling in and out of the system. So police, when they're making this arrest, they can make a determination that this person will be better um, treated by receiving intensive case management services. At that time, they can fill out some paperwork and they can ask the person, hey, would you be amenable to participating in this program called LEAD where they would have some folks engage with you, they would help you address some of these, you know, underlying issues that you may be struggling with. Um, 
So that's basically what an arrest diversion entails. The police officer can divert the person into intensive case management services as opposed to just having them go into the jail and potentially just cycle in and out. Um, that was in place for several years and um, it was so successful that the police literally had people in the community approaching them saying, you know what, um, I really wanna get lead services. Could you guys arrest me so I could get into the lead program? And the police were, you know, thinking, you know what, this is obviously not the way that we want to have folks coming into the program only through arrest diversions. We should be able to proactively and more of an upstream way engage these folks without them having to be arrested. And so the police said, you know what, let's create what's called a social contact referral where we can proactively engage people. They don't have to have committed a crime and we can still offer them these same really good services. So that's what a social contact referral is. It's more proactive, whereas the arrest aversion is more reactive. Um, so that was in place for several years between 2011 and 2020. When COVID hit, um, we, you know, there were some challenges um, around uh, staffing with the police. Um, and, you know, through our policy coordinating group, which is the group that makes the policies and practices that we put in place in working with this particular population, um, we came together and we made a decision that it would be prudent and efficacious to open up the referral process also to the community and have them identify people who could potentially benefit from lead services. So in 2020, um, we opened up to community referrals, which involves regular community members, could be business owners, could be family members, could be public defense attorneys, could even be prosecutors. Um, they can all make referrals. They don't solely have to come from police officers. Um, that program is still in place in Seattle. We still prioritize police referrals, we always have, but um, we can also receive those referrals from community members. And um, if you guys see in our title, we have LEAD, which stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. Um, the community referral process is what is known as Let Everyone Advance with Dignity. So those, what those, those, that's what those two different acronyms mean. Um, it's also important to note that the community referral um, process is very popular nationwide um, in many jurisdictions around the country where LEAD is also being stood up. Could you go to the next slide, please, Sam? Um, something that is really, uh, that really resonates with law enforcement and that what really sets LEAD apart from other programs is this capacity to facilitate a coordinated community response, is capacity to facilitate care coordination amongst police, prosecutors, and behavioral health providers. Lee, pro Lee provides a framework that brings all these different stakeholders into a room um, and breaks down silos, which enable communication amongst parties that historically have been kind of averse to communicating with each other. You know, a lot of behavioral health providers are averse to communicating with police and prosecutors. Police and prosecutors sort of have a symbiotic relationship, so they're accustomed to those channels of communication, but providers typically weren't in those conversations with them. And LEAD provides a framework that breaks down those silos. So we have, a standing meeting called an operational work group where we engage in those conversations. Um, in some precincts in the city, those happen bi-monthly and, and some precincts, they just happen monthly, but they're all on a recurring basis. What's really great about these operational work groups is that the police who I mentioned earlier, they make the referral. They identify the person in the community who is committing public safety infractions. 
that are related to their behavioral health challenges um, and or extreme poverty. When the police make that referral, that information is sent over to the prosecutors and sent over to the project managers. We coordinate that information. Um, at the operational work group meeting, we all sit down in a room and the police will tell the provider um, and the prosecutor, this is the person that I've referred. Here's what I'm seeing them doing in the community. Here's the reason why I made the referral. Here's where you can contact that person and engage with them. Um, and then the provider, by being in that room and hearing that directly from the police officer, they get a better lens on the person that they're going to be engaging with. They then coordinate with the police and finding that person. Um, when they find the person, they engage in a screening of that person. Um, they also engage in a um, biopsychosocial assessment of that person if the person is amenable to services. Um, and uh, they take that information back to these operational work groups, and everybody has a conversation about this particular individual and stays in this feedback loop, which really, um, you know, uh, improves care coordination and wraparound services around this particular client. If let's say the law enforcement officer sees that person in the community, um, they know what's going on with that person. Um, it better enables them to engage that person in a more constructive manner. It better enables them to communicate with that person, understand what that person, um, what that person's underlying um, circumstances are. So uh, this framework, the operational work group lead, it breaks down silos, it improves coordination, it improves upstream engagement with folks who experience crises, um, opens channels of communication to proactively engage those crises. Um, and I could go on and on and on about how this um, framework uh, better enables a coordinated community response to public safety issues. The last thing I'll cover is that the community is also able to attend these meetings with us and they play a vital role in flagging particular hotspots where they're engaging issues in the community. So um, we'll, you know, we have business owners and um, folks that run chambers of commerce um, like organizations that are really um, involved in the process and can flag particular areas and sort of help us direct resources to areas where folks are experiencing um, a lot of behavioral health issues. Um, and Tara mentioned, you know, during her intro that we engage in a lot of education. That's something else that's really good about the operational work group is that it enables us to educate police and prosecutors, engage in a lot of really good advocacy work through those conversations. It enables the police to engage in community policing, right? So there's a lot of overlap with other policy interests that the different stakeholders have that the LEAD framework enables them to engage in and um, get those policy interests taken care of simultaneously while they're addressing these public safety issues. With that, I pass it off to Sam. Thanks, John. Um, so this is a pretty complicated graphic, maybe too much for a PowerPoint, but I was wanting to share this with you to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what LEAD looks like on an organizational level. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of different organizations that are involved with LEAD, um, and this is just for Seattle. So as Tier and Sean mentioned, LEAD is a program uh, that has been replicated in other locales across the country and some international, and it's going to look a little bit different in every locale. But basically, at the very top of this is our policy coordinating group. Um, this is a consensus-based governing body. They make all of the big decisions for LEAD. Like they, they're the ones that told us to open up to community referrals, like Sean was saying. Um, PCG, Policy Coordinating Group, is composed of pretty much every governmental actor that has uh, a say in LEAD. So the city council, the King County Council, 
the King County Executive, the Seattle uh, City Mayor, um, SPD is in this group, as well as the King County Sheriff's Office. Both prosecutors' offices are involved in this. Um, ACLU is in this, um, as well as us, PDA, who is the uh, contract holder. So PCG um, contracts to us, PDA, um, and we do the project management for LEAD, and then we subcontract to service providers. So um, some of our service provision in the Seattle area is done by REACH. Um, some of the other service provision is done by an organization called Community Passageways. Um, and then obviously, um, uh, or not obviously, but uh, our, uh, we have another service provider from the ESC called the Coat Team. They're uh, contracted to work specifically with lead clients who are on the True Blood list, which is a list of folks whose competency has been raised in court. Um, essentially, this list is a, a proxy for folks who have like higher levels of mental health needs. Um, and so they, it warrants a little bit of additional support. Um, Tierra and I and Sean, we all do a lot of work as well, coordinating with folks who are not on this list. Um, so we have um, liaisons with both of our prosecutor's offices, uh, both the city and the county. Um, and th those people are also paid by the LEAD program. Um, they work specifically with our clients to try to do legal coordination. And like Sean said, there's situations where, you know, based on the care plan and the current situation with the client, they can negotiate cases down and try to um, try to improve somebody's legal outcomes. Um, we also work with a lot of folks who are not paid by LEAD. So uh, the police department, we receive referrals from them. Um, and we often conference with them on like situations they're seeing, like this specific area seems to be a hot spot, or this specific client, I've been seeing them a lot, and we can take that information and kind of improve our um, strategic deployment of resources or our care plans around people. Um, we also work a lot with community members. Um, like Sean said, we receive referrals from community members. Um, but also, like, if there is a lead client, say, that is, like, camped in a certain location um, and is uh, known by neighbors, project management will often work with those neighbors, and we can try to help them understand what's going on. Uh, this is the services that we're offering. Um, and if there's things that are coming up, like, say, this thing that a client is doing is impacting the neighborhood, we can work on that and try to preempt things like 911 calls and um, try to improve the interactions that are happening and just you know, generally trying to make things go well where they wouldn't otherwise. Um, all of this is to say that LEAD is not just an organization or a program. Um, one of our co-EDs uses the term often a coalition of the willing, but really um, LEAD, whatever locale it's in, should be considered as a multi-party framework for different actors, um, like Sean said, who don't necessarily often work together, but for people that want to be um, in a place where they can coordinate and make good decisions about individual people and situations. Um, this is uh, a few outcomes from studies. So these are hosted on LEAD Support Bureau's website. Um, like Tierra and Sean said, LEAD started in Seattle, um, is now in locations throughout the country and some international. Um, and they host these studies. These are all actually from Seattle. Um, one interesting outcome I always like to point out is that 2% increase in the likelihood of gaining shelter from each council, uh, not council member, a uh, case manager um, and client interaction. Um, and I think each one is also associated with a 5% increase in gaining uh, permanent housing. And this is really interesting to me just because every, every client has a very different story and a very different path. And obviously there are a ton of external factors that can influence these outcomes too. Um, like the re region's overall shelter capacity. Um, you know, if there are COVID outbreaks and shelters, obviously that's gonna be a big impact on somebody's likelihood of obtaining that shelter. Um, but I think it's interesting because, you know, we're not just waiting with, or dealing with long wait lists for these resources, but we're also working with folks who are coming from like any point in, in their path. So somebody that might have um, more or less serious mental illness that they're also working with, somebody that might have substance use disorder, Maybe somebody has had bad experiences before working with either social services or law enforcement. Um, and that can really impact the level of trust they come into the situation with. For a lot of our clients, um, case managers, you know, spend a lot of time building a relationship um, before even working on this stuff because it takes a lot of trust to engage in these really like labor intensive processes. Um, so I think the, the, associate, the direct correlation between case manager interaction and these positive outcomes like shelter are, um, I think really telling about how much difference it can make just to have like a person that has human contact with you and is forming a relationship and the impact that that can then have on 
housing and health outcomes. Um, every year we do um, a series of like outcomes of just how many folks have got shelter from LEAD. Um, these are the ones from 2021. We actually have a few that we did for October. Um, I mean, like, like I said in the last slide, I, I am really psyched on the shelter and permanent housing outcomes that we've had. Um, partially because a lot of our clients are folks that don't have other forms of support. You know, we're working with folks who for one reason or another, um, you know, have, they're engaging in, they have behavioral health needs, they have, they're experiencing extreme poverty, and for one reason or another, the criminal legal system has been the primary response to those, uh, those circumstances. Um, people that are caught in the revolving door of incarceration, um, and that, that can also have some other impacts on the resources available to them. Um, our clients' criminal legal history can often put them at the end of waiting lists um, for things like housing, um, and also like a lot of uh, service providers um, in the city aren't necessarily equipped to deal um, with the needs of folks who, you know, if they have higher level mental health or behavioral health needs. So, you know, a lot of, like I said in the last slide, a lot of this is building relationships so that we can work um, with somebody on their unmet needs, um, helping them obtain things like legal income, uh, housing, uh, mental health supports, et cetera. Um, another thing I want to point out is this uh, improved legal situation um, piece. So this is often happens in the way that like Sean was talking about in OWGs where uh, prosec our prosecutorial liaisons and case managers will come together um, and they'll talk about what's going on. And, you know, based on those interactions, they, the prosecutors might be in a place where they can negotiate a charge down. Um, you know, for example, if somebody has like a housing opportunity coming up. Um, and they are engaging with their care plan. It can also look like things like somebody has court obligations, like a hearing uh, coming up, and those can be really hard to track, um, especially for somebody that's living unsheltered. So case managers help people keep track of their court obligations so that we can prevent those court obligations from interfering with future um, aspects of their care plan. Um, one thing that this doesn't reflect is something that's hard to capture in data uh, or in singular like outcomes like this, um, which is just, if people have the support and they we are filling unmet needs, they're much less likely to generate 911 calls in the first place. So in one of those um, longitudinal studies in the previous slide, there was, I think, a 58% uh, decrease in the likelihood of somebody being arrested. And that, those are just things that you don't see in these sorts of outcomes, people just having less uh, engagement with the criminal legal system. Um, and that is really one of our, our main goals. And um, that, I think that's one of the big benefits of the community referral system as well, right? If we're talking to community and we're we're learning about what they're seeing in their neighborhood, we could potentially intervene and make something go uh, get on a better path uh, before law enforcement is even called. Um, and maybe I'll stop sharing a screen for a moment. Um, we have Maria here who has personal experience with the LEAD program, um, and she's agreed to share some of her experiences. Um, let's figure out how to stop sharing this. Uh, Hi. Maria up with us. So I'm sorry, this is really loud back here. I'm I'm actually at work right now. I had to come outside of the office because uh, I was getting bad reception in there. But so I'll introduce myself. My name is Maria Nevertakis. I've been a part of the LEAD program since 2004. And let me tell you a little bit about my story. You understand why I've been with the LEAD program so long. Um. So of my criminal history, I've been arrested 125 times. I've been in prison three times, not just in the state of, uh, in the city of Seattle. Um, I was in the, I was on the streets for many many years in the sex trade. I was due to drugs. I had mental health issues, and I mean I was on the streets since I was 12. You know the lead program actually a police officer that knew me very well because he arrested me several several times, um, referred me to the lead program. Um, in the beginning, um, I wasn't ready to go to lead because um, kind of like what Sam was talking about, the trust issue. But you know, lead program kept the doors open for me. And when I finally um, decided to let my walls down and let the lead program work for me, it worked miracles in my life. You know, um, the lead program has helped me with housing. It's helped me um, get my life together. You know, um, I was homeless for over 35 years. I was in addiction for over 45 years. And make a long story short, I have two years and four months clean now. I have my first job. 
I have a driver's license. I have no warrants. MHA Lead Program was able to facilitate all that for me. And it started off with just putting me in a harm reduction building. That was a huge piece of um, how I got my life back together again. Because the harm reduction got me off the streets. And you know, in the beginning, I did not find recovery. But again, Lead Program helped me with that as well. You know, I ended up getting a did get one more charge because of drugs. And um, the leak program got me lawyers. They made sure I made my court dates. Just simple things like that. They helped me, supported me, and encouraged me to keep going. Because there was a time when I really just gave up on life. You know, um, I now have no warrants, like I said. And um, I'm living life on life's terms. I even have a job. I'm working for downtown Seattle, cleaning up the same streets I used to tear up. You know, um, I really wanted to come out today and talk about the LEAD program because the LEAD program saved my life. And, you know, and I'm not being dramatic. I'm being, I'm being real about that. It helped me with all kinds of situations. Even while I was in the harm reduction building and in the beginning, and I was still using, um, I had problems with addictions because I couldn't pay my rent. They helped me with lawyers. They helped me, um, and sorry, it's loud. They helped me with lawyers to, to, uh, to mediate with, you know, um, the problems I was having at the building, you know, um, the lead program has been there for me and I've built relationships with them to where, you know, it's more than just um, caseworkers. It feels like as a friend, they really care. And um, anyway, that's really all I have to say with the lead program, but I would, I'm going to suggest that, you know, if you guys are thinking about um, starting this in your state, you should, because it really does save lives. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'm going to reshare the screen and hand it over to Thank Chita. you so much, Maria, and congratulations on all of your accomplishments. Thank you. Is that sharing with the map? I can never tell. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, all right. So um, incredible um, testimony by Maria. I want to acknowledge that. And all the um, work she put in and um, um, incredible accomplishments that she has made. Um, moving into LEAD across the nation and internationally, um, LEAD started in, as we said, in 2011, downtown Seattle in a small neighborhood um, with, with some days where LEAD was available and some days where LEAD was not. Um, and since then, LEAD has expanded to over 80 different jurisdictions across the nation. And um, I think four jurisdictions internationally. This map is slightly outdated, but it, it, it does give you a good picture of where LEAD um, has, or where LEAD has um, been at least explored. So blue dots represent where LEAD is currently operating. Um, purple dots indicate areas where um, LEAD is launching. Some of those have launched that I know for sure, like Ithaca. And um, orange is where LEAD is currently in development and then, um, or developing, getting ready to launch. And then um, yellow is where LEAD is being explored. So in the, within the Public Defender Association, we also house the LEAD Support Bureau that provides technical assistance to um, jurisdictions across the nation and internationally where people are interested in exploring and establishing uh, LEAD programs. And we've had different um, funding sources. Sometimes it is locally, sometimes it's state funding, sometimes it's federal funding, and sometimes it's a great big mix. Some of the work that LEAD was able to expand to do in Seattle included federal uh, COVID relief dollars and um, the NAT or the LEAD Support Bureau is pretty good at um, identifying and uh, funding sources and um, sharing working with folks to apply for those. Um, I will also say that, oh Sam do you want to advance to the next one please? Thank you. Um, so I will also say, so LEAD is pretty well uh, practiced, um, as you can see by the map. 
Um, I'll also say that in Washington state, following the Blake decision, Washington state Senate, Senate passed 5476, which um, implements the requirement for law enforcement to divert people into um, programs that follow the lead core principles. And so that has opened up an opportunity, um, which includes state funding, recovery navigator program to implement, basically implement lead across the state, including areas where lead was not operating. Um, and the, uh, it is actually written into the bill that the um, recovery navigator program and any di any program that that officers divert people into, as a result of the requirement, follow uh, lead core principles and use harm reduction practices. So this is um, some that it's pretty cool, at least for Washington State right now. And in advance, and I we have included here our titles and contact information if you're interested. Um, feel free to reach out to us. We do have the lead support bureau that we can connect you with, even if you'd just like to talk about exploring what lead might look like in your area, some of your political dynamics, or um, how to um, uh, present to local leaders and politicians about um, implementing lead. So please feel free to reach out. We'll connect you to the right um, person and happy to provide any other further information. I think that's it. Sam or Sean, unless you have anything to add. Nothing to add, but happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Hey, hi there. Thank you all for this presentation. Really enjoyed it. Let me turn my camera on. I'm afraid I need a haircut, but I'm going to be brave enough to show up. So hi. Uh, so yeah, so I'm curious to know in regards to um, getting this started, right? I'm I'm wondering in regards to funding, this must come from like Department of Corrections or something to that nature. Funding wise, like for this program, I can I can take that. I think um, funding wise, I guess it depends. What um, I, location are you from? Uh, well, I'm I'm in Long Beach. I'm a capacity building provider, but I'm thinking about for those who may want to find a way to start initiating this or getting this started. And I know sometimes they may need funding to get that going. Yeah. So if that was the case, if someone is brand new to this, interested in doing it, want to get this going, what would be some early, like what would be some next steps for them and preparing them for funding to keep it going or get it fully going? Yeah, absolutely. So um, usually the uh, lead support bureau team would would talk with you about who are some of the um, what are some of the political dynamics in your location. At least in areas of King County where we've expanded, we start with meeting with the local law enforcement jurisdiction, local city council, and mayor or city manager, kind of depending on you know who um, you know how dominant the mayor or um, city council is in the area. So um, having interest by the parties, including um, prosecutor's office, is always really helpful to begin with. And then um, some jurisdictions don't have the money or don't want to initially invest in it, like they want to see that it works, right? Even though um, it saves money from the legal system, right? Like you're preventing there's lots of money spent on every arrest right um we have explored uh local funding state funding or federal funding and and there are grants available for some work like this um so i would uh i don't i you know i don't know exactly based on your jurisdiction but um i would i could happy to connect you with the lead support bureau so they can kind of discuss that with you there are probably, there is probably federal dollars that are available for this work at this point. And in Washington state, there's plenty of um, state funding that has been um, state funding, state grants that you can apply for to do this type of work. No, thank you. And I like the idea of starting with the, the state prosecutor or a prosecutor and then even folks from like local council 
um, I think that is a great start. So thank you for that. Thank you. Absolutely. And some of them know of, of funding resources for, for things like this. And maybe just to, just in case, maybe would it be a good idea to maybe find like someone in law enforcement as a buddy or an ally to kind of walk with yes. you? Yes, <laughs> definitely. If they're interested in exploring it, um, that that helps a heck of a lot. And um, our lead support bureau even has a retired police chief as one of the um, site uh, um He's, the, I think, the director of like policing engagement for sites. So he was um, the uh, police chief in Ithaca, New York, for quite some time. I'll say the the same goes for like prosecutors too. You know, people part of lead is just like like we said, building connections and like coordination between different actors who don't traditionally do so. And people always really benefit from hearing kind of one someone that speaks their language. So having a, a police officer there to speak to police and and for everybody else too. Yeah, Ansha, there's there's a there's a team of folks that are specifically set up to help facilitate, to help co-facilitate you through this entire process. If you want to connect with them, they know how to get started from the ground up, who to connect with, and they'll work with you in doing all that. So connect with the, the Lead National Support Bureau. We can give you that contact info for sure. Oh, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, I just wanted to to double dutch back in and I'm going to ask Glenn to unpin everyone. So Glenn, can you unpin us? So we can just have a big group discussion. So I think one of the things, kudos to you all for the amazing presentation and also kudos to, the, to having Maria. And Maria was amazing. And I think the, the thing that I so appreciated about having Maria is because I think that oftentimes when we have organizations come and present about their services that they provide, you know, we are looking at it from the lens on, of, of providers. <laughs> and oftentimes having the, the perspective of someone who actually has gone through the program and speak to the benefits is amazing. And one of the things, you know, that I really appreciated about what you laid out and the ways in which you all engaged the community, um, the police and others to support uh, the, the LEAD program is oftentimes I think when we, we really start to dig deep those social determinants that we often talk about kind of on a surface level, but it's not until you really start digging deep, does one lead to the other that leads to the other that leads to the other leads to the other. Because even with Maria talking about, and Maria, I'm gonna humbly use bits and pieces of your story if she's still here, is the fact of, you know, sharing the fact that you've been arrested like 112 times. And 112 times, and you're talking about mental health issues, substance abuse issues, homelessness, all those like onion peel layers of an onion that we peel down that we call social determinants of health that impact the way in which folks move through the services that we provide. And I think the beautiful thing that I really appreciated about the LEAD program was at each one of those identified layers, there was something that supported that individual. So when you talk about someone who may be arrested a multitude of times because of their substance use, which gets them noticed, but then it's okay. So it's like your substance use may have gotten you noticed, but the fact that you're chronically homeless, the fact that there might be behavioral mental health issues, and it's not just addressing that one thing. And what I appreciated in Maria's story and the way that you all have your program set up was that not only was there somebody there to support the individual with the case management, but I like what you said, Sean, about even when there's, um, there's a legal um, kind of criminal or legal Inter, inter, entanglement, and that might impact how a 
person is or isn't able to access housing? And how do you how do you kind of address that? How do you have ways in which, as you mentioned, a charge down to 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 get it to a point where somebody is able to access those those services um, to deal with that chronic housing so, or homelessness. So when we talk about it, and for anyone who wants to chime in and thinking about the potential of this type of service in your your jurisdiction or you know a lead program to support your 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 populations who may be having some um, substance use issues that impact their um, engage them or a, a, with the the potential of of jail time and then all these other ways in which lead has developed these systems to kind of address that peeled onion. And I'm just wondering what others think, um, how this might work for them or could work for them. You can either type it into chat or just come up and let's just have a conversation about it. Let's have a conversation about what was just shared. What do you all think? For anyone that would like to share. I'll go ahead and share a little bit. I um, have never really heard of the LEAD program. This is my kind of introduction to it. So thank you for all of the valuable information you're giving us. I'm just starting our outreach program. A lot of what we're doing is um, having our syringe exchange participants come to our clinic and we're finding that just doesn't work all of the time. And we're also finding that there are holes in the services that we're offering. So we're starting our outreach, which has brought me to reaching out to our law enforcement more. And um, my main question, if rather than thought, I guess, would be where y'all started with law enforcement in order to kind of link that together where we can offer services where they're needed and meet people where they're at. So thank you, Timothy, and um, congrats on the steps taken to start working on outreach. Um, if I understand the question correctly, where where to start with law enforcement, right? Yes, because I wanna make sure that I'm not stepping on toes. I wanna to make sure that I'm going where people already have the information. Mm -hmm. Obviously they know where people have been found or where people may be incarcerated during to their usage. And I wanna see where I can kind of offer a link between the two or a mediation between the two or a collaboration. Right. Yeah, so um, I would, I you know, I'm not familiar with your local jurisdiction, but um, I would, start with um, somebody within the law enforcement, maybe it is the chief and maybe it's um, you know assistant chief or somebody starting to have the conversation about what your jurisdiction is doing about people who use substances. Um, what we find in Seattle is that, especially over the last few years with a decrease in law enforcement's capacity, that um, enforcement of drug use have, has been deprioritized and incarceration like jail, using jail space for um, uh, substance use is, has been um, deprioritized, which opened people up, admittedly opened law enforcement and um, people who utilize traditional enforcement to use our services when they may not have in the past, right? So um, having the conversation about um, wanting to address um, the um, address public substance use and um, in an effective way, and you're welcome to use all the materials we have or outcomes that we have, we'll find that there are some, there's somebody, um, sometimes law enforcement, maybe it is the chief, maybe it's the, the total enforcement culture, or maybe it's you know somebody in there who you can find as an advocate who will say that like, this has not been working, like I've arrested, I can name a few people um, that I've arrested several times for these issues and they've never really had the issues addressed, never really gotten any better. And um, some people, some officers who will admit to saying, um, it's, I don't, I don't want to anymore and it's useless um, arresting someone over and over, but I just don't have any other options, right? Like they feel like they have to address the um, concern of a particular business or the concern of a particular community member. 
I find that we're more effective when we say that we are addressing those issues. Like we will talk to that particular business. We will talk to that particular community member and um, also try to address the concerns of, um, of people that are called victims, right? So um, whether that's theft or property destruction, we also do all sorts of type of court types of coordination. I've even uh, worked with businesses to help them facilitate um, requesting a window repair from the city um, so that they don't need to press charges against somebody to have it repaired. And what we do find is when people know that there's an option that will address their need, they, um, they tend to go towards the better option um, you know, one that's more effective or the one that's less harmful. It's just us people usually depend on what they've always had available to them, right? Which is cops and which is 911 and which is traditional enforcement strategies. So um, I would say if you can try to make a relationship with whoever some of the leaders in the community are. So maybe um, we're regularly talking to BIAs, um, um, so business improvement areas, main businesses that are uh, targeted for theft and um, property destruction, those types of things. Talk with them about some of your efforts to um, help people address their underlying needs that will reduce um, some of the impact and that your intent is to also address public safety and public order. And law enforcement's usually uh, a little bit more receptive of that and um, the community too. If you validate someone's concern, right? You know, it's not okay to have your window broken every week. And, um, but we also realize that you're not addressing someone's unmet behavioral health need by arresting them. So can we really uh, do what works and that will also reduce the amount of times that your window is broken? Thank you. You definitely filled up a half a page of notes for me. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'll invite, I said a lot, but I'll invite my team too, who does this on the daily. I would just add that, I would just echo what I said before, that there's a team of people, the lead National Support Bureau, they do this all day, right? So your question, they have strategized with jurisdictions around the country and cold calling chiefs, pitching, how do we, how do we get this started? Like you see there's a vacuum of those types of partnerships in your community. The lead support bureau knows how to take a situation where there's no relationships and facilitate you in making those connections and or helping you harness existing relationships and co-facilitating you into making that happen. So please contact them. Thank you so much. I definitely will be. I, I think Tierra covered what I was thinking very well, but I just like from my experience, like on the project management end of this, it's like talking to a lot of folks, whether it's a law enforcement officer or like a community member or a BIA businesses, like folks who may not necessarily be bought into like a harm reduction philosophy. I, I always just think of it as like doing outreach, but to house people, you know? And it's like people, I think people in general, like recognize that something is not going right. Folks that are like, you know, in that revolving door who like aren't having their, their needs met um, and like, people are generally kind of like they know something's going wrong and like often like what we do like how we respond to societal issues is like business is normal because that's what we know how to do and so just like looking for for those like points of confusion for those folks and like hey this is like what we can do and like maybe working together we can figure out a different way to approach this and I mean it's you know obviously that's complex and different for every person but just like having some like faith in the idea that people want things to go better. Thank you all for that. Sue, any other questions that folks have? So one of the things I was really kind of curious that I'm just wondering in working with the, the police, if you ever had any kind of pushback in the sense of, you know, you know, some folks may not may, well, if there's any pushback that you've gotten for whatever reason or however that might look. And how do you handle that? Um, I can speak to like some of my own experiences. Um, I mean, I think in general, like uh, the lead has been established in Seattle for a long time now. So 
there's there's probably a larger understanding of how this program can benefit all parties involved um, in a way that might not be there for a jurisdiction that's starting up a new lead program. But I mean, even even now in Seattle, after over 10 years of being in lead, um, we do get pushback um, in different situations. Um, so for example, like, like Tierra was saying in Seattle a couple of years ago, there was something called the Blake decision, which decriminalized drug possession. Um, and that basically put police officers in this position where they, they are no longer in, like arresting for drug possession, but also other resources weren't set up um, for, for them to like necessarily refer people to. We get a lot of lead referrals for anyone that like a law enforcement officer encounters with uh, drug possession, with drugs. Um, and that's not necessarily like, we don't have capacity for all those referrals. We might not be the most fit service provider for all of those referrals, but at the end of the day, it's like they weren't given clarity on what to do. And so I think there's been a lot of confusion, um, both in law enforcement, um, in prosecutors' offices, in the community, with lead. Um, everyone's a little bit confused on how to proceed with these new laws. And so like there's, you know, that can manifest in different ways. Like I've had um, some like law enforcement leadership in certain precincts that have voiced like, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if like this is working like maybe we don't have enough of like the stick you know and we need to complement the carrot with a stick and so we can just like try to talk about like one analyze like where is this coming from like what's their their personal context and then just try to figure out like what is our stance with this specific issue and usually it's just like you know we're here to like offer what support we can we cannot promise to be a silver bullet in any situation mm -hmm. but we want to work with you and just kind of like being consistent um being truthful um just being upfront with all of our partners about where we are at. Uh, I'll, I'll add, I have a bad habit of making it sound a lot easier than it does. <laughs> we um, we do consistently have pushback, even from law enforcement we've had relationships with for many years. Mm -hmm. And I think it just, um, it ebbs and flows based on their frustration within the community areas um, where people are frequenting or, or an increase in um, retail theft, those types of things. There's been um, areas in the retail core of Seattle that the city and law enforcement have prioritized as cleaning up, right? Um, for, or to, for people preparing for people to arrive for tourist attractions. One of the barriers we've always faced is we can have a lead client fully engaging and have no shelter space for them or have no housing for them, sometimes for years. So someone can be making progress, unable to make significant progress because they're still living outdoors and obviously still present outdoors. Um, so we have had um, pushback and, and people asking, you know, why isn't if I started making a couple of referrals, why isn't this street cleaner or why isn't um, the retail core better or why hasn't this retail theft reduced yet? Um, we have had really high needs clients who engage in um, problematic behavior for long term because their um, serious mental health needs have not been uh, yet addressed or because they continue to cycle in and out of jail and we're constantly having those conversations with prosecutors or law enforcement to try to um, make some progress. Um, for some people, it takes many years. Mm -hmm. um, they will refer uh, people to us because they don't know what else to do. People who have really, really complex needs that we're sometimes we're not sure it's going to work um, or we don't know when it's going to work, but we'll stick with people and do the best we can. And it's hard when. Um, people like prosecutors or law enforcement try to hold us accountable for um, someone, you know, messing up or uh, continuing to engage in um, illegal behavior. And we tell them that like, you know, we're doing our best to make them well and, and work with people to make progress, reduce their impact. Um, but we're, we're here to be a resource, right? We're not here to be a probation officer, we're not here to like enforce what you're asking, um, um, even though, you know, we are trying to reduce their impact. So um, we have those conversations all the time and sometimes they're not um, that comfortable, but <laughs> we do what we can and we do what we have to. 
And we continually continuously use that as an opportunity to advocate for the gaps in resources, right? Like so access, direct access to shelter for people who are known um, to be what our city calls high utilizers of um, uh, the criminal legal system and jail and advocating for direct access to housing resources for people who face competency issues and cycle in and out of jail because of that. No, and I really appreciate you all's perspective because what I'm, what I'm hearing is that the systems that we have in place, sometimes they can be a little complicated in the sense of, you know, pushback and getting that buy-in. I love the fact that you're talking about the bill that decriminalized um, drug possession, and I'm wondering, you know, what was that, that whole push to, and the, the inertia to get that up and on the ballot to be something that's voted on, and how does that impact the way in which you do the work, or which, you know, and also, I would imagine, too, the, the fact that you have individuals that are needing services and folks looking to you all to say, well, if I'm making this recommendation for these services, why isn't the need being changed immediately? Why aren't people getting access and seeing this change uh, instantly and realizing that it's it's it is it's not a it's not a it's not a quick race. It is something that's going to take time, energy, and that there are multiple ways in which, you know, someone may have found themselves in a system of, of homelessness, um, looking for care as far as their mental health. And it may take some time to be able to, to have opportunities, as you were saying, Tierra, in the sense of, you know, housing just not being available and somebody being fully engaged in your system of intensive case management. But if the services, aren't there, the housing's not there, um, and there's some other ways in which they're entangled with the police and the police not thinking that things are moving fast enough and being able to broker those conversations. That's why I really appreciated when you were talking about the kind of your community advisory meetings to have some conversations where people can share understanding of what is going on I also love the fact that you were saying, you know, if somebody's store window gets broken into, um, you know, what can be other ways of support to get that repaired versus trying to arrest the individual and hold them financially responsible. So I think that you all have just provided some really amazing and wonderful ways in which the LEAP program can work and does work but also just the realities of what that work looks like in the context of you know, the partners and the context of providing support for individuals. So I just wanna say, as I'm looking at time and managing time as well, I'm gonna say thank you. So let's give a kudos to our amazing presenters. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Also have a, um, another question, that poll question that I wanna ask you all before you all leave. So, and that is, as I am pulling this up, so given all of the amazing information and the conversation that we just had from the wonderful lead folks that I can, you, you are the I, can identify at least three benefits for developing a jail diversion program as part of an array of SSP harm reduction services. So earlier, folks may not have known if you had a program or even, you know, what an SSP was, but now that you've, you've heard some information, you can identify at least three of the benefits for developing a jail diversion program as part of your array of SSP harm reduction services. So folks are agreeing, strongly agreeing. Yeah, it sounds like folks realize that or maybe realizing that it's really kind of beneficial, can be beneficial to providing those services for your individuals that may be at risk for jail and having something as an option, as a diversion to that jail time. 
Okay, so then I also want to say that if by chance you missed like our first um, SSP session, or if you want to go back and revisit this one, um, it's going to be on our YouTube channel. So all you have to do is if you're a YouTuber or a YouTube person, just type in California PTC and that will bring up our YouTube channel. And then from there, you can find our SSP uh, Community of Practice series. So I just wanna make sure that we point that out. And as we wind down, I also wanna ask you all another riddle for another opportunity for that gift certificate. And I wanna say that um, <laughs> I had um, missed that Isabel was actually the first person to answer that question correctly. And Ariel was second. So we'll do both of you amazing individuals with a $10 gift card from Starbucks. But I have another riddle. So here we go. So I can start a war or end one. I can give you the strength of heroes or leave you powerless. I bet be snared with a glance, but no force can compel me to stay. What am I? So what do you think? What's the answer to the riddle? Somebody says hope, words. Mm. So did I not give it a good dramatic read? I can start a war and one. So, you know, this time I can't believe I have folks stumped. Okay. All right. I do not see up. Uh, someone says they agree with the words now. Okay. Timothy, thank you. So <laughs> we're looking for the answer. So this one is going to surprise you. Oh, confidence. Okay, so folks are still trying. Okay, so um, no. So here we go. Survey says the answer is love. It is love. So, and with that, I love the fact that you all shared this time with us today. Thank you, thank you once again to our amazing presenters from the LEAD program. And we put a fact sheet into the chat, which shares some additional information about the LEAD program. The presentation will also be uh, available on our website. So if you want to, to have a copy of the slide, you'll be able to, to get that. But I just wanna say, Thank you all once again for joining in. And we look forward to our third and final um, community of practice, which will be in December and more details to follow. Thanks again to Tierra, Sean, and Sam. Thank you all and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.